Thanks, Isabel. And yeah, hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much for coming along. Uh, this is a topic that Paul and I love talking about, and it's always nice to have other people who enjoy listening to it, talking about it, um, and chatting to them in, in the questions and things as well after. So please feel free to pop your questions in there. There's really no such thing as a silly question. Um, so yeah, whack them in there. And um, for anyone who doesn't know, this session is uh, kind of the first of a little series that Paul and I are running about um, cartography, geographic data visualization, um, and then we are, we're running three virtual sessions and then one in-person workshop actually later on in the year. So have a look on the Geovation website for the other sessions if you're interested in those. Um, lots of different topics, some are a little bit more technical, some are a little bit more about the fundamentals of cartography that we're going to be talking about today. Um, in terms of the content that we're going to cover, so we're going to start off with a bit of introduction as to who Ordnance Survey actually are. Um, and who the Geo Geographic Data Visualization or GeodataViz team are. Um, then look a bit at what GeodataViz actually is and kind of how that relates to cartography as well. Um, go through some of the ways in which cartography um, is implemented in different GeodataViz projects and the different ways that you can show that. And then we're going to finish on some of the real fundamentals of cartography and all of those different elements that go into creating a map as you would kind of expect to see it. So I'll kick off with an intro to the GeodataViz team, which is Paul and I. Um, there's just two of us at the moment. We're about to get third person, which is very exciting, but it's a pretty small team. Um, we're both technical relationship consultants at Ordnance Survey. and We specialise in a thing called geographic data visualisation, which is a concept I'll go into in a second. Um, in terms of our background, so Paul joined OS um, as a cartographer and then the, the cartographic design team, as it was called then, was formed in 2006 um, and then it moved from cartography into a different part of the business and was renamed to the GeodataViz team, which is what it's called now. Um, it's gone through lots of different iterations, but it's kind of a really, um, you know, evolving team. We work with lots of different parts of Ordnance Survey as well as externally as well. Um, and then I joined Ordnance Survey about three years ago. I joined on their graduate programme and did that for a couple of years and then settled in a permanent role working in GeoDataviz about a year ago. So I've been doing this for about 12 months now. Um, as a team, we do lots of different things, things like this. So um, kind of external workshops and events and things and helping people to learn about cartography and GeoDataviz. Um, we create custom data visualizations and kind of aesthetic things for our social media teams as well. Um, we also work a lot with the data that OS produces to turn those into something that's, that's a bit more cartographic. Um, and we work with our um, consumer channels as well. So the kind of get outside, you're familiar with that. It's a part of OS who are really focused on helping people to be outside more often and giving people the tools to, that they need to be able to do that. So as a bit of an intro as to who OS are, um, I thought I would give us a kind of a uh, very quick run through as if you're not super familiar with, with where we come from, what we, what we do, what we do now compared to what we've done in the past. So Ordnance Survey is the national mapping agency for Great Britain, which means that we're really the definitive source of maps and location data in GB. Um, not every country has a national mapping organisation, so we're in quite a unique position actually in, in GB where we've got a really large amount and high quality of data about where things are, um, geographic features and things are mapped to a very high level of accuracy. We actually started back in the Tower of London um, about 230 years ago, back in 1791. So this was the first office of OS um, and it was a military organisation back then. So that's where the name Ordnance Survey comes from, is the kind of ordnance which means things like military defence weapons and cannons and that sort of stuff. And then survey because we were mapping where those things were so that we could defend ourselves against invasion, basically. So putting those two things together and you get ordnance survey. Um, but although we started back in 1791, we didn't actually make a map until the early 1800s, which was when the southeast coast of England was facing invasion. Um, this big map of Kent and basically was designed to show where vulnerable points were and where we needed to defend ourselves essentially. But we've come a long way since then um, and now there's about 1,500 people who work at OS. Um, 
doing things all over the country. We've got surveyors who work remotely, lots of people who work in Southampton, which is where our head office is based, um, doing all sorts of jobs from your kind of traditional cartographer to things like data analysts, people working in remote sensing, people working on things like machine learning. It's a really varied organisation to work for, and there's lots of different types of roles which you probably wouldn't expect going into creating these maps and data sets that we produce. Um, and some of those things are listed here. So I think lots of people assume that OS kind of just produce those paper maps, which are what we're really famous for. Um, but there's a lot more to it than that. So we obviously do do that. We create these kind of up-to-date definitive um, maps of Great Britain, mapping them up to a three-year currency. Um, but then we also do things like creating data sets. So things like where all of the postcodes are or where all of the addresses are in the country. And then people use those to be able to more precisely work out, um, for example, where to maybe send uh, an ambulance to or to um, direct more funding to potentially. Um, and then we do things with the public and the private sector to help support critical infrastructure and services. So, for example, um, things like electric vehicle charging points. You know, if you want to put lots more of those in a certain place, you want to know where it's going to be the most effective place to do that. So maybe where roads are, where infrastructure might already exist, and where the highest levels of demand are going to be. So using geospatial data is really important in kind of getting more um, high quality answers to questions like things, things like that. And then um, we've got the OS Maps app as well. Some of you might have that already. Uh, it's an app that you can get on your phone or you can use it on your computer. And it's got loads and loads of routes that people put in, um, walking routes, running, cycling. And you can use it to find uh, kind of good places to go and get outside in, in your local area. And then the last one on here is, is really about innovation. Um, it's something that we do quite a lot of at OS. And we are quite a constantly evolving organisation. You know, we've been going since 1700, so there's been quite a lot of change since then. But um, things like 3D modelling, um, using different remote sensing techniques, uh, things like aerial imagery are obviously quite new as well. So really trying to push the boundaries of what's possible with geospatial data. Then there's a video here which I think really well brings to life the kind of impact that OS data has on your day-to-day -day lives. It's not something that you might necessarily notice. But I'll press play and you'll probably see that it affects more aspects of your life than you might expect. I think it, it's a nice video because it um, shows how, what we do today, but also uh, we've really come from a place of, of cartography. That's what we're known for. That's what our history has been. So um, it's a nice intersection in this session, I think, about that cartography element, but also what we're doing today and how geographic data visualisation um, kind of brings that into modern age, which is what I'm going to kind of talk about now. So in terms of what geo data is, is um, we use a few different terms sometimes, geographic data visualisation, geodataviz, GDB, but they all mean the same thing. <laughs> There's a lot of, kind of acronyms and things often, but they're all referring to the same thing. Um, 
and I'm sure you know there's, there's a huge huge amount of data in the world and it can be quite hard sometimes to really make sense of that and be able to interpret it in a way that's accessible, understandable, um, kind of comprehensible really with the quantity of information which is being thrown at us. Um, but using visualisation is one of the easiest ways that we can do that really and can make sense of the data. There's this stat on the right hand side which I saw recently which um, says apparently in the last two years 90% of the data that exists in the world has been created so it's a kind of exponential increase in the quantity of information that's in the world and um, things that we might want to understand and I think that sheer quantity is a little bit overwhelming sometimes but not necessarily all of that data is going to be things that we want to visualize some of it is going to be things like metadata or programming scripts or things that just don't really have an element that you can visualize but some of it will be able to be um, so when it's maybe got a spatial element that can be visualized so potentially something like coordinates that can um, be displayed geographically um, and when when you do visualize that data with a geographic component i think it helps it to be made sense of much more easily um, and it's a nice way to make it more accessible to people as well you know if you gave somebody a huge huge spreadsheet with loads of numbers and columns and data in it and just ask somebody to make sense of it it would be a pretty big task and quite hard to actually pull out the trends and patterns and things in the data but when you show it visually and you help tell that story with the visual element of geographic data visualization it just makes it a lot more easy and a lot more engaging for people to understand and they are going to want to look at it as well but data visualization isn't just restrict, restricted to geospatial things it's what we do at OS a lot because that's the nature of our organization we're, we're a mapping agency but geographic data visualization can include all sorts of things so you've got maps obviously but also things like charts um, graphs dashboards infographics as well and I'll go through a few examples of those a little bit later on with um, regards to how cartography can be used to kind of tell stories with regards to those um, and, and geodata viz things like this, like the ones on the screen, they can be used to show patterns in the data, maybe to give a fresh perspective on a data set, um, something you might not think of initially when you look at it, or you can use it to combine multiple data sets and show those alongside each other, um, and also to answer questions and kind of gain deeper insights into the data set. Uh, and, and another way is just as a piece of art, I'm sure lots of people on the call who are passionate about maps have got some sort of map displayed in their home I know I've got quite a lot um, they're just nice to look at as well so data visualization can fall into that category too uh, some of these examples on the screen are ones that we've made at OS some of them are from other places but it just shows the really wide variety of different types of things that fall under that kind of geo data viz umbrella and I think when we talk about geo data viz a lot of the time people assume it's quite a new thing you know we see lots of like the examples on the last slide lots of the things that are made with um, computers in this kind of digital age using high processing power technology but actually GDV it's not a new thing really and there's lots of examples of it throughout history um, so this image on the screen is the Napoleon March map which some of you might have come across before it's quite famous it was created back in 1812 by someone called Charles Millard and it shows the journey of Napoleon's army's march to Moscow so you can see this thick orange line at the top um, starts off very wide, gets a little bit more narrow as we go towards the right. And that's basically representing the number of soldiers which were on this march. They started off with about 470,000. And then as the journey went on, um, fewer and fewer soldiers remained. And then on the way back is shown in the black line. And you can see it gets thinner and thinner as the number of soldiers gets less and less. And then I think another clever thing that they've done in this geodata visualization uh, example is used another data set alongside it to give a bit more context to the story so at the bottom of this you can see there's a line which shows the temperature that they were marching through so when you combine those two multiple data sets you can kind of see what one might have impacted the other and gives it a little bit more of a kind of story to the data which you wouldn't have necessarily got otherwise Um, and there's some really great benefits of, of geodata visualization. So often the visualizing of your data is the last bit of the process. You might have collected it, cleaned some data, analyzed it, got it all ready to show. Um, 
and then you want to present it in a way that people are going to find interesting and engaging um, and so you want to make sure that you're getting that bit right because if somebody looks at it and their first impression is that oh i don't really want to see what that's looking at it's not very interesting it's not very engaging to look at then you've got you've lost your audience really but when you do it well it can bring loads and loads of benefits so things like communicating information really effectively um, it can give context to a data set show trends that you might not have noticed otherwise uh, potentially give you an idea of what's going to happen in the future as well like predicting future patterns um, and it really brings data to life in a way that would otherwise be quite hard to do um, and make sense of and again as i mentioned before it makes it quite accessible to a wider audience that they wouldn't have done before um, it's a great way to get people interested in a data set really and we talk about geodata viz a lot here um, but cartography is really the fundamentals that underpin geodata viz so paul's going to go into some of the real core principles of cartography a bit later on but um, there's some kind of very um, grounding fundamentals really that you you want to use when you're displaying data so that it's going to be as effective as it can be uh, be as engaging as eye-catching as it can be and that really comes from the cartography element So we're going to go through a couple of, uh, well, a few examples about different ways in which we at OS have um, tried out GeodataBiz projects in a way that we want to tell stories and how cartography has been used to tell that story with a few different um, kind of mediums. So the first of those is um, designing products and kind of creating the map in the first place. At OS, we create data sets a lot of the times I mentioned but before anything cartographic has happened to that it just looks like this that you can see on the screen so it's a lot of points a lot of lines and a lot of polygons which get given a random color and doesn't really look very uh, easy to understand you can't tell what's what you can't really understand what's going on in this area so that's what it looks like before you've applied some sort of cartographic styling um, but then once you have it looks like this so it has that kind of context it has that um interpretable look that you would expect from a map and this is what what paul and i and the geodatabiz do with creating something called style sheets um which customers then take and apply to the data that we create and it creates something like this map and it's cartographic principles that really go into creating those style sheets so that people interpret it in the way that you want the map to be interpreted um, and maps in general are obviously a really great way to help people understand the world around us a bit better. They're a kind of 2D representation of the world around us and help us navigate, get from one place to another, um, understand where something is or where we need to go. Um, and they've been used for a whole host of different things throughout history and at lots of different scales as well. You know, you've got very local maps of, of very small areas um, right through to maps of the whole world so um, real wide spectrum of uses and different styles and things that you can give them as well um, but the way that you uh, use cartography to make the map look like a map in in terms of how people are going to interpret it can be really powerful um, to shape how somebody's going to interpret it maybe to create a certain um, mood for the map or one that's going to represent the area which you're showing as well so it helps to tell that story of an area beyond just purely being used as a navigational um, aid, really. And then another thing that you can do with cartography and geodatabiz is create animations. Um, these are a really nice way to visualize data that's got some sort of temporal element. So that's something that's happened over a span of time. Um, and this one is an example from the South Central Ambulance Service. Um, it shows NHS 999 callouts over New Year's Eve in 2018. So every blue dot that you can see is a different callout. Um, and they've all got timestamps and locations. So we could put this onto a map and animate it to show it over the span of one evening. Um, the different colours uh, represent whether it's a critical or a non critical incident, and the size is showing how long it took to respond to each incident as well. And showing something like this as an animation is a really good way to help identify those patterns you can see where lots of things are happening where there's not so many things happening um, and it's a nice way to grab somebody's attention as well we're quite 
like we quite like looking at videos i think a lot more than looking at static images sometimes so it can be a nice way to make it a bit more engaging as well then dashboards are another way that um, cartography and geodatas can go hand in hand and create something which is really nice and can tell the story of data really well so this example that's being shown on the screen um, is RNLI callouts around the coast of, of Great Britain. Um, it's an interactive dashboard, which means you can just click the drop down and zoom to the specific location that you're interested in. Um, and you can see what type of casualty it is um, and other sorts of information related to the data as well. And I think the nice thing about dashboards is that it can show a huge, huge amount of data. You can get loads of different layers on top of each other if you want to have lots of type, different multiple data sets together to show um, maybe different parts of the story or to give it that context that it needs. But it's not in a way that is really overwhelming because you just focus on the specific place that's relevant to you or the type of data that's um, interesting to you if you're looking at a certain part of it. And then story maps are another nice way that you can use cartography um, to tell a story. So they're quite a new thing. They were kind of coined by Esri, I think, a few years ago. Um, there's a great Esri, Esri tool called, called Story Maps where you can create them very easily. Um, and they're very good for telling those really visual interactive stories with things like maps, videos, images and charts all integrated into them as well. And they help the person, uh, well, the person that's using them can, can work their way through the story map and work their way through the narrative that you've created with it. Um, you can have interactive maps and these kind of sliders integrated into it as well. Um, so this is one on the screen that we made to celebrate 20 years of the OS Master Map Topography layer, which is something you might be familiar with. It's our kind of flagship product at OS. It's a super detailed archive, really, if you're looking back at 20 years of data about how the country has changed. So we use this story map to tell that story. And then something similar but a little bit different to story maps is these scrolling maps. So these are often coded with HTML, which gives you a little bit more flexibility about how you can um, display the data, the way that it's kind of shown next to any context as well. So here, this scrolling map has been used to show locations of different brewdog pubs around the country. And you can see on the right hand side, there's um, names of specific ones. A bit of information about each one and then on the left hand side we've got os data zooming into each of those locations and you can get a little bit more detail about each of them as well so again it's quite interactive the user can click around and um, interact with different parts if they want to and it's a nice way to get people engaged through the story that you're trying to tell um, and then another thing that we do a lot of in the team is creating these kind of custom geo data visualizations and these are really kind of quintessentially cartography and geodatabases combined, I think, because it's where we use a lot of the cartographic principles that we're going to, but we want to create something that's a little bit different to your traditional map. You know, you're not going to use one of these to navigate, um, and they're a really effective way to tell a story. So this one is one that Paul made to um, show a guy called Ewan Thomas, who is one of the OS Get Outside champions, who was on Celebrity Hunted earlier this year. And he went around the country, he was trying to avoid being caught basically by the hunters. Um, and we mapped his journey, all of the places that he went, some of the things that happened to him along the way. And you can see there's a elevation log along the bottom as well. So you can see the different kind of elevations that he went through uh, as a chart, as well as the map. Um, and I think this is a nice example of where we've used cartographic principles to create something that's really aesthetic and it really tells the story, but it doesn't look like you know, your traditional paper OS maps that you would expect to navigate with. Um, another couple of examples of things like that. So here on the left, we've got one which I made for the 70th anniversary of the Lake District becoming a national park. Um, this is using OS data. We used lots of uh, raster tiles and then merged those all to create this more aesthetic kind of artistic interpretation of a map rather than something that you would navigate with. Um, and on the right hand side, we've got a poster which we made a couple of years ago of all of the areas of outstanding natural beauty and Scottish uh, national <laughs> scenic areas as well. Um, they, they go down really well on social media as well. And I think 
people love that kind of artistic cartographic element as well um, and it's a nice thing to be able to look at and um, see what they're all like and kind of compare them and again be able to get that story of ones that they've maybe been to um, different sizes of them and, and compare and contrast them next to each other as well and then we also have things like charts and graphs which can be um, used alongside cartography really really well to give another element and a bit of context to the data so um, this example on on the slide shows car park capacities based on council ticket machine data um, you can see it's got a temporal element to it as well so it goes throughout different periods in a day and how many cars are parked in each car park um, and then also shows that on a map as well so it gives the kind of geospatial element to it too which i think helps give it a bit of context brings it to life people can see what you're actually talking about rather than just looking at, at a chart um, and this is one of the things i think makes geodata is uh, really powerful that you can combine multiple data sets you can get really creative with how you show it um, use it to tell that story give a wider sense of, of the picture and the story that you want to get people interested in so i think that is the end of those examples yeah um, and i'll hand over to paul for a bit of um, fundamentals on cartography and actually making maps thanks jess Isabel, was there has there been any questions as yet? Not at this stage. No. Okay. Can everyone, Jess, can you just confirm that we can see that? Yeah, looks good. Real. Okay. Thanks, Jess. That was great. Um, so in this session now, we're going to take a look at what cartography is and kind of some of the science behind it. I think Jess has kind of already emphasised this, but I think it's important to emphasise it again that cartography is just as important today as it has always been. It's just that not just Jess and I, probably the industry as a whole, tend to refer to it as a form of geographic data visualisation. Um, you know, you are essentially taking geographic data and visualising it to make sense of it, essentially, which of course is kind of what all data visualisation is really. Um, so I think that's important to remember. And we do live in a world where we do have access to a wealth of open data, open tools uh, and, and open software. So this means that there are more map makers than there probably have ever been before. So part of what we do in, in our team is kind of help educate and inform on why car, good cartographic design is still really important and why cartography is still like a really important art and science. So, you know, we might all have our own interpretation of what cartography is, and there are many, many definitions definitions to be found, um, many penned by different cartographic institutes, whilst others exist by the likes of Wikipedia. Um, and if we kind of surmise what Wikipedia called it, they're really talking about that kind of whole study and practice of maps, which I don't really agree with just being that. I think it's a lot more than that. So my favourite and probably the simplest and easiest to remember is from the British Cartographic Society and they call it the art, science and technology of map making, which I think is really good because, you know, for me, if we're thinking about map making and that whole process. There is an art to it. There is a science and there is obviously technology associated with it. And that's obviously evolved throughout the many centuries that cartography and map making um, has been, been around. So if cartography is the art and science of map making and a cartographer obviously is somebody who makes map, what exactly is a map? So in its kind of simplest form, a, graph, a map is a graphic summary uh, of the wider world. It's the geography around us presented um, as symbols and it's scaled down and simplified to make them understandable to the user. Um, and the kind of relative position and nature of features on our map are kind of surmised in order to communicate a message or in some instances tell a story um, maps you know they do vary greatly in their graphic forms as i'm sure we're all aware um, but i think most maps attempt to convey a kind of real message and they kind of portray aspects of real world geography as closely as they can 
And essentially drawing a map just means understanding our world a little bit better. Um, for centuries, um, we've used the tools of cartography to represent both our immediate surroundings and the kind of world at large and to convey them to, to users, to other people that want to use our maps. And we can use these contemporary or personal maps to kind of showcase things like specific regions, to characterise local areas, even to do things like generate moods. So it's, it's worth emphasising that maps are just more than navigation now. Um, and kind of just touched on some of those other techniques that you can use to tell stories with geographic data earlier on. So when I was kind of thinking about what's the best way to kind of talk about cartography, one a quite important slide would probably be just to kind of talk about that whole evolution of mapping. You know, where have we come from to where we are now? And, and I kind of put it into kind of four real building blocks to how that whole map making process has evolved over time. You've got kind of data capture, that map drawing, the technical revolution, and then map design. So if we think about data capture, that's the kind of earliest methods of gathering data about our Earth's geography. And, and you know, going back as far back when, um, that kind of data capture was probably restricted to like sailors or travellers reports. Um, and that would have probably then gave way to surveyors producing maps from their own observations. So as they went out and were travelling, they were then producing maps from what they had actually seen as opposed to taking the word of a sailor or a traveller coming back and telling them. And then you had the development of mathematics and then the kind of introduction of scientific instruments like the compass, the telescope or theodolite. And that then led to that kind of uh, systematic and kind of measurement of our landscape. And then since the kind of 20th century, we've had things like aerial photography and satellite imagery, which has then, of course, allowed us to kind of really quickly survey the world around us and the landscape that we live, we live on. Well, I think um, uh, your slides really... have just gone a bit more zoomed in. Sorry to interrupt. I'm not sure what's happened, but if maybe if you unshare and reshare them, it might fix it. Yeah. OK. Not sure what happened there. Let's try again. Anywhere? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Well, cool. Um, yeah, next up was map drawing. So um, the first maps were drawn by things like ink, uh, brushes uh, and parchment and kind of were probably very limited in number, very, very unique. And they would have been very, very expensive. You know, you'd have had to have quite a bit of money to be able to employ somebody to, to make you a map or to have brought a map. Um, and it wasn't until the kind of invention of the printing press that allowed mass production uh, and the distribution of maps before it made it easier, and more cost effective for people to be able to afford maps. Um, wood engravings uh, gave way to copper printing plates and you had lithographic means of making printing plates which were developed so that maps could be produced consistently and a lot more cheaply and then printed colour came along and then paper improvements came along so things like fine lines and lettering could be printed a lot easier too. So then you had the technical revolution so since then about the 1970s, computer technology has meant that we could join up data capture, map creation, reproduction, distribution, and map use in a way that we would have probably thought was unimaginable in the past. And of course, GIS came along, so a kind of ge geographic information system, and that changed the game completely. And these have continued to kind of evolve and improve the way we work with and visualize geographic data. And there was a complete different range of software tools and equipment to help us with that kind of full map making process today. Uh, and then you've got map design. So the kind of change in designs of maps through the years kind of reflect the growth of things like graphic design. Um, and of course, you've, you've also got that kind of continuing search by cartographers to obviously find better ways of visualising geographic data. And you can kind of see that. I mean, a lot of today's map making methods, if you compare them to kind of the 1990s, the 1980s and the 1970s and even way back before then, they are very different. And there are a lot more different new techniques that can be employed to visualise geographic data. I mean, one thing it is worth mentioning to kind of finish off on that whole map design process, and it's, I think it's a, a valid point, it's worth pointing out, that though throughout the history, the kind of principles um, 
of good map design haven't really changed. You know, map design has changed and the, and, the, and the way people represent information, but the kind of principles of what goes into good cartographic design haven't really changed that much. The kind of what applied half a century, a century ago, still kind of applied today, which I think is really important. So we're going to delve a bit more now into the kind of fundamentals of cartography and, and what we mean by that. There are kind of four graphic elements that appear on most maps that we're kind of pretty much, I'm sure, very, very familiar with. You've got points, you've got lines, you've got polygons or areas, and then you've got text in the form of a label. And most maps will have all of these elements. Um, and the process of map making involves the cartographer classifying those kind of real world objects into these four graphic elements. So if we imagine Very the sort cool. of thing that might be done again. again. It's done it again, but I can share from my end if you like, and you can just let me know when to move on if it wasn't doing it earlier. I'm not sure why it's Go on it. No, yeah, is that right? It's weird. Yeah, of course it is. That's weird, isn't it? Hmm. Okay, hopefully you can see that then, just let me know once you want to move on. Okay, will do. Okay, where was I up to? <laughs> I don't remember, <laughs> what was I talking about? Oh yeah, so there's kind of, um, uh, so we can talk about the kind of things that are represented by those different features. So airports, trees, churches, etc., will commonly be classified as a point and these will be represented by a symbol or graphic. And you have things like roads, tracks, or rivers would be classified as a line, and then buildings, woodlands, and water, for example, would be classified um, as a polygon or as an area. Now, don't want to forget about labels. Um, they're obviously important to any map, um, and they kind of add context or meaning to a map, um, and that's what kind of labels are required. There are points where a map might be familiar to somebody, so you might not need to add as many names. Um, so that's some, kind of something to think about. Um, and the amount of labels that you show on your map would be determined by your scale. So, um, you know, I'll, go, I'll, I'll touch on scale a bit in a, in, in a moment, so it's probably not worth talking about that now, but obviously the scale of your map can affect the amount of labels that you might show on your map too. One next slide, please, Jess. Thank you. I am getting a slow network message keep coming up. That must be my end, I would have thought. You sound fine. Anyway. Your your signal seems okay. I do. It's not okay. Fair enough. Okay. Okay. Um, so most maps uh, have a means of showing uh, which part of the earth they are depicting. So there are two kind of common systems used on maps to do that, and they are latitude and longitude, and then you've got coordinates um, on a national grid system. So to kind of give a bit of explanation of what latitude and longitude are, so latitude denotes how many degrees, minutes and seconds a place is either north or south of the equator, and then latitude will, uh, sorry, longitude will denote how many degrees, minutes and seconds a place is either east or west of a, like a zero line, which is almost always the Greenwich Prime Meridian. So for us, for, for Great Britain, uh, Ordnance Survey created the OS National Grid, which is a map grid used to define locations in a given area. And it's a, it's a rectangular grid imposed on our kind of curving earth. And it has its kind of origin, its start point well west of Cornwall, so that all the points on the grid have a positive number. So if you come along X and Y, they're all positive. So any point in GB can be given a location by stating how far east, which are the east ends, and how far north, the north ends of that point that something is. And pretty much every country in the world have their own have their own map grids. Next slide, please, Jess. Um, so the Earth is a three-dimensional object, um, but the vast majority of maps are obviously two-dimensional. So we need to transfer the shape of land or oceans from a round globe to a flat map, so how do you do that? So you have to kind of develop a mathematical approach to ensure that each point on the globe appears where it should then do on the map. And this process is essentially called map, proje map projection. It's quite a difficult subject to get your head around. You know, I found it quite difficult to understand when I first learned it. I still probably don't fully understand it, but I think I've kind of got the kind of basics right. 
But if you want to kind of think about it in the easiest way, how the easiest way to understand it, it is think about how difficult it is to kind of map a three-dimensional object to a two-dimensional surface. And the best way to visualize that is to kind of imagine peeling an orange and trying to lay it flat. You know, as you try and do it, a few things will happen. You know, as you peel and flatten the skin, you will encounter a few problems. So things like shearing. So as you stretch the skin in one or more directions, you might get a bit of shearing on, on the skin. It will tear, so it will cause the skin to separate, and then you'll get compression. So as you force the skin down, it starts to bunch and condense. So that kind of gives you a good indication of how difficult it is to kind of lay a 3D object onto a 2D surface. So, you know, if you think about that on an orange, you obviously get the same problems when you try and transfer shapes from a globe onto that. You can't avoid distortions. You can keep certain things right. So you could keep distances between points correct. You could keep relative areas correct. Or you could keep angles correct. You can't keep more than one of these properties at any one time. And there are kind of then different types of projections that you can, you can name them so that you understand what each one does. So those that keep area correct are called equal area or equivalent. Those that keep distance correct, they're called equidistant. And those that keep angles correct are called conformal. So they're kind of most pretty important. And there are hybrids, and these kind of try to keep things as accurate and correct as possible. But in all of those instances, neither the area, distance, or angles are 100% correct. You know, they're they're all a little bit off, but they have to do that because they're a hybrid. So they don't focus on any one thing. They kind of try and get every aspect as close as possible. Um, for most general purpose maps of the world, you'll need an equal area projection. If you're thinking about things like distribution, so showing things like population or land cover, then you should use always use an equal air projection. That's because the user will see land masses in the correct position. Um, any map that used for navigation should use a projection that would keep things like angles correct. Um, and then if distance is important, then it's a equidistant projection that you'll need. Um, and there are absolutely hundreds of projections out there and they all distort the earth in slightly different ways and they all serve a purpose depending on the type of map you're making and they're all kind of worth having a look at depending on the type of map that you're making next slide please Jess. it ran over it ran over my end there you go i don't know if it's there or not cool so a geographic information system uh, I kind of touched on earlier, and these are used to kind of create, uh, manage, analyze, and map all types of geographic data. And they, they, they really change the game. And they provide a kind of foundation for mapping and analysis that is used in science and almost every industry today. Um, and they really help us understand patterns, relationships, and geographic context with the data. And of course, there are absolutely tons of benefits to this, and it, it, it improves things like communication, efficiency, um, better management, uh, this better decision making. You know, just touched on how the way you visualize data can kind of allow you to gain insights into data that you perhaps didn't know exist, or relationships or patterns. And you know, a geographic information system can help you do that. Um, and the great thing about GIS is they have projection, projections inbuilt into them, so it's taken all that hard computation away from you. So you just need to load your data in, set the projection, and away you go. Next slide, please, Jess. Oh, scale. Nice one. So um, all maps are reduced versions of the world or scaled down versions, and scales are represented a ratio of the map distance to the ground distance. So a scale of something like one to 100 would mean that one map unit represents 100 of the same units on the ground. So if we want to get our head around that, we can kind of use a real example. So let's imagine the road that we live in is 10,000 centimeters or 100 meters long in the real world. And we want our road to be represented by 10 centimeters on our map. In order to work out what our map scale would be, we would divide the length of our road in the real world, so that's 10,000, by the length we want to represent our road on the map, which is 10. So this would give us a thousand. So our scale is one to a thousand. So one unit on the map is a thousand units in the real world. 
So if you think about that in, in, in terms of measurement, this means that one centimetre on the map is equivalent of a thousand centimetres or 10 metres on the ground. So 10 centimetres on the map is the equivalent of 10,000 centimetres or 100 metres on the ground. And we can add this represent, representation to our map using a scale bar, as you can see on the screen. Um, at the top, you can see the units of measurement on the ground. So we're looking at the scale bar right at the bottom now, which is metres, uh, sorry, which is centimetres. And on the bottom, you can see the units of measurement on our map, which again is centimetres. And you can see there that one centimetre equals a thousand centimetres on the ground and 10 centimetres equals 10,000 centimetres. Of course, you could change that to metres on the top. So if you wanted to show that one centimetre equals 10 metres and that 10, 000, uh, 10 centimetres equals 100 metres, you could obviously change that if you wanted to. But we're, for, for the purpose of explaining it, we're keeping everything from centimetres. And it's worth pointing out that not all maps always require a scale bar. If it's a very familiar area or it's a sketch of a map, then a scale bar may not be necessary. So it's just about making that, that judgment. Um, but a lot of people would say if your map is to carry any kind of authority, then it probably should really contain a scale bar. Next slide, please, Jess. Cool, thank you. Um, so it might just be nice to touch on what the difference is between large scale and small scale, because I think we, we've probably all heard of it, but you know sometimes we don't fully understand what we mean. So um, you know, this is all about the difference in how does it affect the way you might represent information on your map? You know, what is large scale and what is small scale? Mean? So small scale maps essentially require a small sheet of paper to show an area with a small amount of detail, whilst a large scale map would, would need a much larger sheet of paper for exactly the same area and it would show a large amount of detail. So basically, if you think of large scale, you zoom in, you think of small scale, you zoom in out. So the image on the left is uh, OS master map, which has a scale of about one to 1,250. So one centimeter on the map equals 1,250 centimeters on the ground or 12.5 meters. Very detailed map showing lots of information. And the image on the right is OS mini scale, has a scale of one to one million to one centimeter on the map equals 1 million centimetres on the ground or 10,000 metres, a lot less detail. And earlier we spoke about how features might be depicted differently depending on your scale of map. So a good example would be to think of something like an airport, like Heathrow or Gatwick. On a large scale map like OS Master Map, which has a scale of 1 to 1,250, you would show the airport perimeter, the runway detail, the buildings, car parks and so on. But on a small scale map like Miniscale, so as you zoom further and further out, you'd obviously show a lot less detail you'd probably depict the same airport using a symbol or a point with a label, essentially. Uh, next slide, please, Jess. Okay, generalization. I think this one might be animated, Jess. You might want to flip through and see if it changes. I can't remember. Cool. This one. Um, yeah, so since small scale maps are scale representatives of the world, but they obviously can't show every feature of the landscape and sh you know, should obviously never try to, you know, that would look really, really messy. So the smaller the scale of the map, the more selective it has to be in what it can show and how it shows it. So generalization is the process of simplifying the kind of real complexity of, of the world around us so that it becomes graphically clear and puts prominence on the features that should be seen for the user. You know, how would you expect to see an urban area depicted at large scale, so a map with lots of details, and how would you expect to see that same area depicted on a small scale map with less details? So it's the same principles as when we were talking earlier about an airport. And then other questions you might want to consider are like, uh, would all roads be required for a small scale map, or would you just want to show motorways? What text would be required for a large scale map? and what should be removed or added for a small scale map. So you can kind of see that when we start to think about generalization, it's how we graphically represent features, the more zoomed in we are, or the more zoomed out we are essentially. Next slide, please, Jess. So as I said earlier, most maps use kind of four types of graphic representation, and we're going to focus on three of them and, and for the purpose of this slide. So it's points, lines, and areas. And there are 
you can kind of vary how those are represented to communicate different types of map information. So you can do that in different ways using different graphic variables. So these include things like size, shape, uh, color, um, lightness, orientation, and then like a pattern or texture. And you can use that to obviously then uh, help you graphically represent those real world features on your map depending on what scale it might be and these can all be affected differently depending on what scale you might be using if you're thinking about things like uh, a visual hierarchy um, you know, obviously you can use these on the same sorts of graphic variables to help you achieve that too so things that you want people to see might be might use more prominent uh, graphic variables like size or color or lightness or darkness or transparency uh, for, I'm sorry and then transparency will be used for those uh, features that you want to kind of mute and put to the background next slide please Jess so we can kind of talk a little bit more in detail about some of the different uh, graphic types for points lines areas and text so Point symbols um, are, are pretty much either what we call geometric. So these are based on shapes like squares, circles, or triangles, um, or they're what we call conventional. So it might be like a red cross for a hospital, or an I for information, or a P for parking. And or they could be something which is really common on maps, what we call mimetic. And that looks like the object that they are representing. So think an aeroplane for an airport or a petrol pump for a petrol station or a fish for you can fish here that sort of thing next slide please Jess. actually you can skip that one don't worry about that one i'm gonna hide that one cool thank you so lines, um, these can be simple strokes, but are pretty much all of slightly more complex than that. So roads, for instance, are often cased with two lines enclosed with a color fill. They might have a center line down the middle to kind of show that central reservation as well. And many, many lines are varied by adding to them essentially. So lines can be broken up and they can be pecked or dyed to represent things like tracks or railways, or ticks can be added to one side to represent a canal, for example. So quite often it's more than just one line. You know, you'll do something with it, like I say, make it a pet line or a dice line, um, or add an another line to it to, 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 to represent something like a, a road or something like that. Next slide, please, Jess. Cool, thank you. So areas or polygons, they form the background to the map. Um, and you know that these are important symbols in their own in, in their own right. They're either most commonly filled with colour or with a pattern or texture, or filled with symbols to represent things such as woodland or marshland, all are there to show like the extent of something. So if you think about ordnance survey maps, it might be open access land or it could be uh, land accessed by uh, the National Trust or something like that. So quite often they're shown perhaps by just uh, an outline as opposed to a to a polygon fill. Next slide, please, Jess. Cool. Nice one, thank you. So when text is used um, correctly on a map, it, it can add loads to that map. Um, but if you do it incorrectly, then it can it does detract from what was otherwise a good map by making it difficult to read. And what I mean by that is you can add absolutely tons of text to a map. People quite often get carried away and think they just need to keep adding, adding more and more text, or they add text with in hideous fonts and things like that, or they get the whole uh, on height wrong, so they've got text in 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 font heights that are totally um, disproportionate to other features. Um, or they might just get carried away with colour and things like that. So it's important when, you, when you're using text that you're doing it correctly. And we use text to label features that we deem important and that require a label. So country names, city names, town names, road names, river names. You know, that's just to give you a few examples of what we mean and what we might label on a map. And there are obviously various techniques that we can adopt when using text. And the first of those is typeface or font. So it's important here, like, don't get 
kind of carried away by gimmicky fonts and think, oh, just because that font exists and, I, and, it, and it looks really cool, I should use it. Because quite often when you use those gimmicky fonts on the map, it detracts from the map's purpose. What's that map's user requirement? So you've got to be really careful to make sure that you use the right font. So what I would suggest is kind of try and stick to fonts that have been tried and tested and are really clear and legible, depending on the kind of type of medium that might be using for your map. You know, even if you're even if you're making a hand-drawn map, you can replicate you can replicate fonts. And there are so many out there. There are so many open fonts that you can use. There are some great cartographers out there making their own that are happily sharing them. You know, and they, these have been tried and tested. So, you know, it's, it, you don't need to use gimmicky fonts at all because there's so many good ones already out there. Next is type style. So this is determined by the choice of fonts. So it's either a serif or sans serif font. So a serif font is one that has those decorative strokes that kind of finish off the end of the letter stem. And then the sans serif one is essentially one that doesn't have that uh, um, decorative stroke on the stem. Then we have type characteristics. So what we're talking about here is upper, lowercase, italic, bold or semi-bold. And you can kind of use those to help you depict the features importance or classification. So, you know, we were talking about like a visual hierarchy. You can kind of use these types of characteristics to help with that. Um, historic text, if we're thinking about classification, you could use historic text to show, to show historic text in italics, for instance. You know, that's quite common to see on a map. Next up is type size. So, they, I mean, I've, I've, I've read, and I've, this is quite common, that most people can read six point no problem five point you can kind of get away with but anything lower than that is a little bit difficult for people to read and again we can use text to show a feature's importance or we can use it to kind of show the extent of something so if it's a really big feature we can obviously uh, increase our text size to reflect that um, so if you think about an example we would probably label label a country with a bigger font size than a city for instance but again it's important to think about the scale you know, if, we, if we're at quite a small scale, imagine GB, and you wanted to show capital cities and country names, your country name would be bigger than it would be for a capital city name, for instance, at that scale. Character spacing, um, this allows us to kind of stretch the text by adding spaces between each letter. Um, you, know, you can stretch your text by extending each letter or condensing your text by removing spacing between each letter. And this is handy for features which might span a large expanse, such as rivers or oceans. Um, you can kind of use some of this for when space might be an issue. So if you need to get your text in, you haven't got a lot of space, you can you know, remove some of that space in between each letter to help you condense it. Because that feature is still important to be labeled, that's a good technique where space might be limited. And then last up is color. So we can use color to associate a color with a particular feature class, for instance. So as you'd expect, things like all our water text could be blue um, and all text associated with parks or woodland or um, national parks and stuff like that, or green space could be green. You know, that's a great way of classifying features. So when people are reading a map, they can instantly say, I know that that's a water feature because it's blue. I know that's associated with green space or woodland because it's green. It's that sort of thing, essentially. Next slide, please, Jess. Um, yeah, so I was going to talk about how the kind of cartograph design principles haven't really changed over the, over the years. You know, that they're, they're, they're still just as really important um, and really helpful and really useful. It's important to emphasise that cartographic design principles or any kind of design principles are not rules that like you should follow these. They are guidelines. And at Ordnance Survey, of probably about I can't remember how old these are now. Um, eight. Eight years ago, we decided that it would be quite useful for us to adopt some cartographic design principles for us to follow based on the type of work we were doing. Um, and they're still just as relevant today. Um, I won't go into them in detail now because we haven't got the time, um, but I will share a link at the end to our GDV toolkit, which is where you can find these principles. And uh, we've got kind of a more detailed explanation of what each one means with an example as well attached to them. So it's definitely worth having a look at. Um, but like I say, they're not they're not rules that you must follow these, they're guidelines, but they are worth looking at because it helps with things like you know I mentioned that visual hierarchy kind of explains exactly what that means and gives you some really good examples 
um, of other people uh, adopting those principles. Next slide, please, Jess. So that kind of brings us to the end of the session. I thought it might be not quite nice just to kind of finish on a really simple statement about the power of cartography. Um, I said before about how we live in a world where people are making more maps than ever before. You know, whether that's mapping a pandemic, uh, you know, which is really relevant and topical at the moment, mapping the effects of war. So if we think about what's going on in Ukraine and things like the refugees leaving Ukraine and just the whole of where things are, are happening in Ukraine and all the maps that we see in the media. You know, the geographic data visualization and that visualizing of data is never being more important than it is right now. You know, cartography as an art and as a science is kind of right at the heart of it. Um, so I think that's just, you know, worth pointing out. Everything happens somewhere. It doesn't matter what it is, it does happen somewhere. You know, and because we know that, we can visualize, we can visualize that data if it's if it's useful. Um, so what I was just quite nice to finish on. Next slide, please, Jess. So these are just some links um, to some uh, useful stuff. I, I guess it might be worth us actually sharing those properly, Jess, Martin, as opposed to just having them here and me explaining them through them. So what we do, Isabel, is if we grab those links and we'll share those so that you can share those with everyone as opposed to having them there because they're not going to really be much use there. But there are just a couple of books on the screen that are definitely worth having a look at, particularly the thematic mapping 101 inspiring ways to visualize data by Ken Field, which is quite a recent book. I've, I've, I've got a copy and I found it really, really useful. It's a really insightful look into the world of thematic mapping. Um, there's a link to the story map of virus mapping that Jess showed earlier, which is great. There's a GDB toolkit, which we'll share the link to as well. And then there's just a couple of things on social that we often follow, particularly the 30 day map challenge, which is in November every year, which is a great opportunity just to kind of be part of or just be nosy and see some of the great maps and visualizations that other people are coming up with. Next slide. And that is it. I um, hope you found the session informative, found it useful. Um, as Jess said earlier, I think right at the start, we have got some more of these sessions coming up. Um, there's a couple of virtual ones one at the end of August, one towards the end of September. Um, I think the August one is how geographic data visualization has shaped history. So we look at some really cool, amazing maps and GDVs that kind of helped shaped our history um, through a kind of really cool time on it, just has put together, which I think you enjoy. And then in September, we've got exploring the visual narrative. So I think this session focuses on the kind of geographic visualization techniques that we can use to help shape a story or narrative and we'll kind of look at those techniques uh, in a bit more detail and I think in that session we'll also look at thematic mapping in a bit more detail as well which would be quite interesting and then I think the, the, the aim is in October to have a, an in-person uh, event at the hub in London with Isabel and that's looking at how geographic visualization can help combat climate change so that should be really interesting too. And that's it. Um, thank you very much for coming along. Are there any questions, Isabel, in the chat? Or... Thank you. Oh, you've made my job so easy, Paul. Thanks. <laughs> you've already done the, the, the plug for the upcoming event, so well done. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thanks so much for that, both of you. That was really interesting. Is it just me? I'm so sorry. I'm sure you got that. You get that loads. But it, does the orange peel remind you of the Loch Ness Monster? Or is that, is that one of those things? It's just you, Isabel. Did I not have said this is unprofessional? <laughs> I've never heard anyone say that before. I just kept seeing the arches of the of the month, sorry. <laughs> but hey, a little bit of history there. We went to Scotland. Yeah, there's some questions there. Um, if you've got any of them, please put them into the chat. Um, the chat is not part of the recording, so you know it. it you know you don't have to worry about that. So, uh, and as Jess said, there's no wrong or weird or or in, indeed stupid questions. So please do fire them our way. Um, 
we've got um, this first question is any plans to create products for non GIS mapping software such as Power BI to make the maps more accurate and more visually appealing? Yeah, so we are, we, 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 there's so much software out there now, which is great that allows us to visualize data in different ways. And there are some people at Ordnance Survey using Power BI um, to kind of map internal processes, um, which does include maps. I've seen a few, I'm sure Jess has too, but we've not actually used it, Power BI just yet, have we? We, we <laughs> do intend to. We've used Tableau and just showed an example of RNLI data being used, but we haven't actually used Power BI in anger as yet, but we do have plans to do it because I think dashboards are becoming more and more popular, especially about reporting on things and allowing people to kind of interact with data as that data changes. You know, we've all seen specifically around COVID and the pandemic, you know, they became really, really popular and there are some really great ones out there. But, you know, I think when people think of dashboards, they automatically think of a map with graphs and charts, but they are a lot more than that. You know, Tableau Public uh, is an open version of Tableau and it kind of sells itself as being business analytical software. But if you look at some of the, the Tableau, I forget what they call them, they're called like Tableau like gurus or something like that, I forget what they call them, but you see them on social and Twitter and that. They are doing some unbelievable stuff. Jess has got a great example of from a guy called Johnny Walker who used to work for Tableau. He did an absolute, what was it of Jess? It was something to do with turtles. It was showing, uh, yeah, where where turtles live around Australia, I think. Yeah, something like that. It was beautiful, yeah. It's it was amazing. You know, and it wasn't just a simple map with a couple of charts and graphs. It, it was a it was a perfect example of using a dashboard to create a really interactive um, map that you could then go in and kind of see information about uh, things that were connected to the map. But yeah, as, a, as, as for Jess and I actually using Power BI in Anger to do maps, we haven't actually used that as yet. Great, I hope that answers the question. Uh, if not, please fire a follow up into the question section. No problem at all, we'll try and get around to it. Uh, again, try and put them into the question section there. I appreciate this is more of a one way uh, way of doing this uh, sort of session. It's a shame that we can't have you all online and all on camera, but I think we would, we would get so distracted by everyone uh, <laughs> sort of being on camera there. Um, uh, yeah, so please fire more questions our way. Um, there's a, a question from Anna there, Jess, for you. Your accessible work on the three different map backgrounds is great. Um, are you able to share the colors that you've used? Yeah, so I think you talk, are you talking about the colorblind friendly styles that we've created a couple of years ago? I believe that's um, what it relates to, yeah. yeah. If not, Anna, please Hello. let us know. Not I think the um, on, on our OS GitHub is where the actual style sheets are. But if you're interested in the actual hex values that we've used for each of those different features, um, we do have a document that has all of those listed. So I'm very happy to share that with you if you like. Um, my I can share my email address with you if you want, and then if you get in touch, I'll I'll ping it over. Um, alternatively, if you download one of the style sheets and apply it to one of the OS products in a GIS like QGIS or ArcGIS, whatever you use, um, it will have the hex values listed against each different feature, but yeah, very happy to. Um... Great, yeah, that sounds great. If, um, yeah, if you if you don't mind sharing that, that, that would be lovely. Otherwise, sure. uh, send it to events at geovation.uk and then I can make sure that you guys get connected as well. So that's not a problem. Awesome. Um, so there's one more question there. That, um, where can I access the OS style sheets to be able to easily make a map from OS data? Great question. So I've just sent you, Isabel, the link to our GDB toolkit on GitHub. So if you can share that with everyone. I will include that in the follow-up email. Content. That was almost like playing you, wasn't it? So basically, all of our style sheets are, are, are in our toolkit. Um, no, they're not in our toolkit. I've got that totally wrong. You need to go to GitHub, to the Ordnance Survey repo in GitHub, 
and then search for the style sheets on there. But we are in the process of trying to create a web page for our website, which hopefully will be coming later in the year, which will have a much more easier uh, user user face for accessing our style sheets. But for now, if you want to access them, you go through GitHub. And if you just do a search for like Ordnance Survey style sheets, you'll get them all come up. Yeah, sorry, that's the toolkit. The style sheets aren't in the toolkit at all. <laughs> that's totally different. Great. No, I'll make sure that we'll include that link into, into the follow-up. Uh, emails there. Um, right, this is your last chance. Uh, if you have any more questions, I appreciate that this is a lot of information that you get all at once, but I know that it's a great introductory um, sort of look into cartography. And as uh, Paul mentioned, we have some more uh, sessions coming up. So please do come back for those. Uh, we will, as I said, send you a follow up email with the link to the recording with the information that, you know, Paul and Jess kindly have provided. Um, I will send a link uh, with, you know, to these follow up sessions as well, so that you can just directly click on there and, and sign up for any of the other sessions in the future. Um, I have also shared with you a feedback link uh, already on the chat today, but it will also be in your follow up. Uh, we always would love to know how we've done, what you found particularly useful of this session, what you might like to see more of in the future, um, generally from Geovation or Ordnance Survey as a whole. Uh, so please don't be shy. Uh, any of the feedback that we get from you is hugely important because I want to make sure the events that we run for our community are relevant for everyone who's part of that community. And I can't do that if I don't know what your blockages or interests are. So please make sure that you let me know. <laughs> and um, uh, and then we can, we can find the experts or we will likely have them already in our network that I can uh, put an event on that specifically targeted at your needs. Uh, so please uh, do follow, fill in that uh, feedback form if you can, please. That would be hugely appreciated. Um, I don't think there's any more questions that have come in now. So uh, unless you, anyone is doing a last minute like records typing there, <laughs> I will <laughs> let Jess and Paul and yourselves uh, go into the afternoon. And uh, yeah, hope that you are all well and that you are um, finding these sessions useful and again thank you so much Jess and Paul for your time it's been hugely interesting and uh, always a pleasure to have you. Pleasure to do it thank you very much. Thank you so no much problems. everyone. Thanks everyone <laughs> thank you. see you in the next one. Take care. Bye. Bye.